everybody here has far more in common than not. There's more that unites us than divides us. We forget that sometimes. I think uh, we find it convenient to forget that. Kennedy said that in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Yeah, we, 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 we like to forget that. And perhaps life is easier lived forgetting that. I, I, I don't know. The other thing is that we are all somebody's child. We all have parents. If we're lucky, we knew them and we grew up with them. And if we were really lucky, they were good. And uh, the reality is with the best of luck, you watch them die. The alternative is the reverse. Uh, nobody should have to bury their own child. But we are all somebody's child until we're not anymore. My father was a, uh, an interesting man. And um, I, I will say... There's no human being alive who has ever understood me better than him. He has understood me in a way that was spooky to me because he could predict my actions oftentimes long before I could. And um, always moved me in a, a, a positive direction, made me a genuinely better human being. Nobody has influenced my life for the better, more than he. He saved my life <laughs> several times. I, I have the infamous suitor gene, which has a, a tendency for thrill-seeking behavior. Um, my grandfather uh, once uh, took a motorcycle, and, uh, literally to win a, a race, went under uh, uh, moving. <laughs> Uh, uh, tractor trailer. Um, my father uh, would parachute um, a lot. He was one of the first Americans to exceed uh, 100 jumps. He was certainly one of the first ones ever to exceed 500 jumps. Oh, God, yeah, he, he, he did a lot of crazy things. I also, uh, you know, during a uh, Category 4 hurricane, I went out and went swimming in the ocean. And um, uh, got caught in, in uh, the undertow and very nearly drowned, and he had to come out and save me. And it, it certainly wasn't the first time he had, he had physically just saved my life. He also uh, saved my life in other ways. Um, my family had difficulties. All families have difficulties. But um, ours were such that he had to leave my family when uh, I was four. And even at, at, at that young age, uh, I certainly remember realizing that it was the best thing for him and wishing he could take us. He couldn't. It was uh, the 80s. Um, husbands never got <laughs> the kids. And um, he spent his entire life uh, trying to make sure that my sister and I could be taken care of. And told us we were a priority in his life, and he acted that way. There was never a time he wasn't there. There was never a time that anything seemed to be a greater priority than his children. So uh, we, were, we were very lucky 
in that regard. Many, many kids don't get that. When I started working in the public sphere, I had to pick a name, especially as a writer, you, you have to pick a name. I, I liked N. Lamar Souter for a little bit. I guess like J.K. Rowling, N. Lamar Souter. Um, so I had um, I published originally as N. Lamar Souter, but people started calling me Lamar, and I wasn't wasn't a fan of that. Um, Lamar Souter was was another story. Um, so I just went with Nick Souter. I figured that was the easiest, and that, that was the one I liked the most and the simplest. But the problem was my father's name was Nicholas Souter, uh, Nicholas Benedict Souter. And when I published as, as Nick Souter, I would publish essays on all sorts of topics and usually quite just uh, inflammatory even in the U.S. And uh, the problem is my father lived in a very conservative community. So they'd get a knock on the door and they're like, hey, did you write this? No, no, there's more than one Nick Souter running around. He wouldn't even say this to me. He was just like, there's some guy out there with a name who's publishing all this material. Now, he, he supported all of it and he was very much in agreement with it. Every now and then he'd call me up. Are you really going to say that in public? Was, yes, dad. Okay, have fun. <laughs> Uh, so I ended up uh, going as, as Nicholas Lamar Souter because the middle name was the only way to keep keep some heat off of him in, in the deep Bible belt. Um, so that's how that's I, I, I that's how I, that's why you always see Nicholas Lamar Souter. He didn't like the name Benedict, and he had told me because he he had a penchant for getting into trouble too. And he um, told me that he could always tell when a, a article was was going to be negative because it used his full name. Let's say Benedict. And I, I thought at first that was that was silly, but I've seen similar things where you can tell when the media is just being disingenuous and how they. I was like, wow, they really, they really. So he's just like, yeah. If I saw Nicholas Benedict Souter, I knew it, I knew I was in trouble. Uh, his name, uh, the name Benedict, obviously carrying still <laughs> a lot of animosity in the U.S. People are pissed still at the name Benedict. You don't, you don't want to have that name. Was, uh, uh, so he had always said he'd, he might change it to Lamar. I, I did love him, but I'm my own person as well, and I, 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 I my, I told him repeatedly if he changed his name to Nicholas Lamar Souter, that's fine. I got no problem with it, but he'd have to be Junior because I had the name first. Uh, that <laughs> that slowed him down. <laughs> um, most he he was a storyteller, and uh, he was a, he, he had stories about everything because he had done so much. He was a pilot, flew um, uh, single uh, or uh, the, the the planes, those small little planes that have only two seats in them. Uh, he used to take us up all the time. We'd go buzz the house, you know. He'd go out, he'd look over, and we'd be we'd be really close to him. Now, this was again '80s and '90s, so the FAA wasn't all over everything. So he could just get in a plane and just go to Mexico, which he did all the time too. Um, but they're, they're dangerous too, um, and I, it wasn't a uh, uh, experimental. Which uh, ooh, those are dangerous. But build your own airplane. And <laughs> sounds like it. Sounds like a plan. It's not Legos. I really don't think you should be flying something you built yourself unless you're an engineer. Um, but he, uh, you know, I had stories about all of it. The landing gear failed. Something, well, a tiny, he did a jump. A guy got stuck on the gear. It was a fixed gear plane. So the guy goes out, gets stuck. I got no way to get him down. Got to figure out how to, how to get him off before you run out of fuel. Um... But the, the uh, one I remember most is he was going to Mexico, and he uh, was going to land at a small airport there, but they had a, a power outage, and he w was known for, for, again, taking risks and not necessarily going with as much reserve fuel as you should have, wanting to make as few stops as possible. And uh, he got there, and the power was out. It was nighttime, couldn't see the runway, and very low on fuel, couldn't contact the tower. It was like a hole in the earth below him. There was no place to land. 
So he's calling for help, and he gets some guy on a ham radio. And I was like, oh, yeah, the power's in Spanish. Says, My father also spoke six languages. He, 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 well, he spoke more than six. He practiced law in six. So uh, whenever they got somebody in, in the hold, uh, that because he was a criminal defense attorney, whenever they got someone in the hold, they didn't understand what they were saying. It was just gibberish. Like, oh, let's call, let's call Mr. Souter. Or sometimes it was Chinese. He's like, I don't speak Chinese. He's like, yeah, but you'll figure it out. And so he, he worked as a public defender a lot, worked for free, um, and defended a lot of people. Um, the people who are most disenfranchised in this state. They can't speak the language. Well, he's in the, you know, he's talking to them in Spanish. Oh, gee, <laughs> I'd kind of like to land this thing. It's on fumes. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, there's no runway. The guy called up all the controllers and everybody who worked at the airport called up all his friends. And they drove down to the airport and they lined up along the runway with the cars facing the runway and they all turned on their lights. And that way he could see the runway. And he landed surrounded by these cars. Um, and then as a, a criminal defense attorney, oh my God, the stories of murder and, and revenge and, and um, he's where I learned to tell stories. He, he had, he had the best. I don't, I don't know. He didn't seem to think they were amazing. I, I thought they were, maybe it was because my, it's my father, but um, he's, he's where I learned to tell stories. I tell them the same way he did. I learned how to tell them from him. I love stories. I think stories are important. That's why I write stories. That's why I write books. Why I do this show and why I try to tell stories in the show. I think they're important. I think they make life interesting. And I think they teach us things that we can't learn any other way. Because he was who he was, he sort of like me, didn't take necessarily the best care of himself. That's another unfortunate suitor trait. We don't take care of ourselves well. I don't know if it's genetic or not. Uh, it certainly has passed through. Um, it means, despite usually having very sound bodies growing up. My father was extremely athletic, did boxing. Baseball was in the uh, minor leagues for a while. Um, he, uh, despite usually having uh, a very solid bodies, we, we tend to die a little less than the um, average um, uh, rate in the United States. And that's just because we don't necessarily take very good care of ourselves. And that's what happened to my grandfather who I couldn't follow the most basic medical advice that he would give people. And nobody's going to get him to follow it because we're all so stubborn as fucking hell. Um, my father was uh, very much the same way. It was hard to get him to go to the hospital even when he couldn't breathe. Um, so... We all know that, again, with luck, we will watch our parents die. That's the way it's supposed to be. Those of us who are the luckiest go through that. Because there's no better alternative. I've always felt like a child. I've always felt like a child. At seven... I thought when I was 10, I'd be grown up. At 10, I said, I'm going to be grown up at 12 or 13, and I'd see the higher grades. It's sixth grade. Those kids have everything figured out, man. They know what they're doing. You go to sixth grade, you're like, ah, nobody knows anything. Um, figure in high school, it'll all get figured. No, college, no. Oh, when you get your first job, no. I'm 40 years old. I haven't figured out shit. And neither is anybody around me. <laughs> anybody who says they've got shit figured out is fucking lying. Um, 
that I, I, I feel like a child because I, every when I was a kid, all the 40 year olds were they were adults. They're supposed to know everything, right? The, the adults are supposed to no, no adults don't know fucking fuck all. None of us know fuck all. I'm 45 or 46 now. I don't know. It keeps changing on me, so I don't, I don't bother to memorize it anymore. If it would just stay the same, I'd be okay. But it moves. Uh, and unfortunately, it moves in the wrong direction. I can't figure that. I can't get that sorted either. But um, here I am. I don't feel like I've got anything sorted out. I don't have the uh, confidence that adults are supposed to have. I can project it easily. Everybody does, but nobody has it. Life is like a movie. You walk in halfway in and you you look at all the people who are watching it and they're all talking about the movie and arguing about the characters and say what's going on tell me about the movie and explain the movie to you and like oh at least somebody gets the movie and then after a little while you realize they all walked into the movie halfway through too <laughs> nobody knows what the fuck's going on you just make it up as you go um so here i am in my mid-40s i you know I, I i experience is the only thing that's taught me much of anything that's got value I've learned a lot about other things. I've gone to school. I've enjoyed it. I, I love learning. It's my favorite thing to do. Another reason I do this show, I get to learn from the guests. I, I know more after I've done a show than before. So I, I, in that way, I, I always get to learn. But the only things I've learned of value are from experience. Usually that experience gained through suffering of some kind. I fucked something up or somebody. I still don't know a whole heck of a lot. So we're, that I can tell we're all still children. I had thought when I was 40, if my father died, I'd handle it like, you know, I'd be like, oh, okay, well, hey, that's life. That's 40 year olds can handle anything, right? And I, I knew that he was gonna die a bit earlier than most parents because of the way he takes care of himself, which is uh, his uh, wife was aware of and good at managing, but uh, sooner, there's only so much you can manage of that, I'm sorry to say. Um, so I prepared myself as best I could and I, I, I thought I was prepared and I was not. Nicholas Benedict Souter died last week. I'm going to be okay. Everybody's, uh, you know, again, everybody goes through this and he had to go through it. Although I, he was always... Again, he knew me better than anyone, so I could call him for advice, and I keep catching myself saying, Oh, I remember when my grandfather died. I know who I should ask for advice about this and to help talk me through it. I should call up my dad, because he knows about this kind of thing. And I was like, I can't call him. I can't call him anymore. I'm gonna fall on deaf ears. I'm gonna fall on deaf ears. Hatred is a terrible thing. I see so much of it everywhere, and it poisons everything. Hatred and anger are the worst poison I have ever seen. We have more in common that unites us than divides us. We forget that, and we forget it when it's convenient. If we could read the secret histories of our enemies, we would find in there enough suffering to forgive all hostilities. I guess if I could say anything, I would say this, and it will fall on deaf ears because people will hear it and they will say it. 
They'll say, that's a good idea, and they will forget. So you have to remind people, you have to say this time and time and time again. I'd like, if I could get anything, it would be for people to be better to each other. For people to be good to each other, just for the sake of being good. Because we're all suffering something at some time. We all have bouts where we can have maybe even a couple of years without any suffering. Of any good. Good. It's good. We all suffer. We all lose our parents. Some of us, God forbid, lose our children. And it doesn't have to be that bad a tragedy for us to suffer. Inflicting it on each other for any reason, unnecessarily. It's a terrible thing, and we do it a lot. So I would ask us all to remember that everybody listening to this is somebody's child. And life is better for all when we are stewards to each other through the good times and the bad and through the bad behavior stewards to each other instead of hurting each other i hope everyone listening to this can maybe do an act of kindness and pay it forward a bit more for a little while we'll forget it will fall on deaf ears we'll need reminders again but that's the way to make life worth living. Thank you.